All right, well, welcome everyone. I've got a ton of cables here. Um, so, how many of you were at my little speech on Sunday? A couple of you? Great! So I'm glad you guys can make it back here today. So today I'm going to get into a lot of the technical side of what I look for in the market. I'm going to share with you guys one of my favorite strategies and I'll even share with you an example of it from today. So I like to do a lot of my classes and my education by showing you guys not just what's happening today in the market, but also what has been happening over the years. So I'm going to start out this class by showing you guys a trade that I had from five years ago. What is important about this is because everything that follows from the beginning to the end of that trade is going to be something that you're going to see repeated exactly in the same detail today. So it's really interesting that I, so I've been started traded about, um, let's see, it's one, 21 years ago, um, maybe slightly over right now, but uh, I got started in a market where there wasn't a lot of technical education out there. A lot of people were transitioning from the floor to online trading. And a lot of the education was very simple. It was just by pullbacks into like 20 period moving averages, things like that. Well, very quickly you realize that is not a, sustain a sustainable strategy over time. What goes into these patterns that helps create one of them that is going to be more successful than another? And so that ended up being developed into what I call the building blocks of price development. And this is basically taking down every pattern and every action in the market and looking at individual components that create that overall picture. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about it in reference to trend exhaustion. So we're going to look at different clues and techniques that you can pay attention to in the market that will indicate that trend exhaustion is coming up. And also I'll share with you guys some reversal strategies to take advantage of that trend exhaustion. All of the charts here are provided by Ninja Trader. Here is the slide that all of you guys have probably seen from the very beginning of when you first started getting interested in the markets. And that is, what is a trend? Well, a trend, obviously, uptrend series of higher highs, higher lows, downtrend, lower lows, lower highs. Boom, very simple, right? But more importantly, what is an impulse move? So when we are looking at a trend, we want to look at these impulse moves that are taking place within a trend. And these are these primary direction of price action where we have average to stronger than average momentum. So you're going to see impulse moves in the market. This is uh, the ES, S&P 500 futures here. You're going to see a number of variations. You will see larger ones where you'll have like a larger trend move. And those are often broken down into these smaller impulse moves as well, like we see back in October, here going into December, and then a really strong one going into the beginning of the year. What I pay attention to is what is an average impulse move in the security that I'm trading? Because if we are at a period of time like going into the highs here at the start of July, where we see one of those average impulse moves having already been very similar to what we saw in the past, then that's a heads up that we are looking for a period of congestion or correction. Things can get choppier. The range might widen up and we start to get more back and forth action. So understanding what those impulse moves are in a trend is really one of the first steps to under understanding the trend exhaustion. Now, impulse moves are fractal in nature, just like trends, and that means that you're going to see them on a smaller time frame and a bigger time frame. So for example, the one here going into February, the major trend going into January, those are things you're going to find as larger impulse moves on a larger time frame. And then when you get into back and forth action, you'll see some of those smaller, more consistent ones that will happen a lot more often than you get the bigger ones. So you got that part. An impulse move is a typical rally or collapse in a security or market where it's average to stronger than average momentum. I'll tell you guys a little bit more about this momentum thing here in just a second. What are the three signs of trend exhaustion? Well, the first one 
that I alluded to just a second ago is to measure the impulse moves in the market. That means we're going to be comparing previous impulse moves to what is happening right now in the market. So here's a close up of that S&P 500 we were looking at. And what you'll notice is that the last impulse move that took place going into June, I went and I drew a nice little trend line from the bottom to the top. I copied and pasted it over here so that you guys could see exactly where that measured move is. Well, when it starts to get into closing in on that level of 100% measured move, that's when I start to look for some more intraday back and forth. Uh, a lot of times you'll get reversal patterns that'll start happening on smaller time frames. You'll start to get bigger pullbacks on intraday charts. Uh, flushes will become more common. You'll even see the momentum of that impulse move start to slow at that time. Now, it can lead into a number of different things. It can lead into a sideways trading range where you'll then get a breakout higher with another impulse move. It can lead into just a slowdown of the trend back and forth as it's going higher, and then it can collapse. Or you can get just the immediate pullback like we saw back in June. A lot of times with the immediate pullback where it actually holds that pivot high, it'll start a little bit slower like you're seeing here to begin with, and then it can gain momentum following that. So when you get that A roughly equals B, I'm starting to look for those smaller time frame back and forth actions. And if I've got a lot of swing trade positions on, this is where I start to look to scale out of my trades. This is a daily chart right here, yeah. And you can see back here in time, going back into May and even before that, I took and um, posted the same the same um, price movement there. You'll notice here in May that this is actually a bit stronger. So the momentum impacted the impulse move. So that it was, since it was a stronger move, it actually went a little bit further. So the pace of the change is gonna kind of help you determine how far that impulse move is gonna be able to go, but you still wanna look for that upper end of it to start to give you that wiggle room and indicate that the trend has a much higher chance of starting to slow at that time, if not completely reverse. So I talked about what is average momentum. So average momentum in any market, any security you're trading, if you go back and you look for back and forth moves within a security where you see these Vs and inverse Vs, Typically, each side of that is what you would consider to be about an average impulse move in the market. Uh, they can form in two ways. You'll get them where they're going up and a lot of overlap, and then you'll get a couple of wider bars and then a lot more overlap, a couple wider bars, a lot more overlap. And they can also do like this, where they'll have a stronger move, a longer correction, and then a stronger move, but then that still creates approximately an average, slightly stronger than average uh, momentum move. So. Keep in mind that concept of momentum as we go forward because it is going to be incredibly important. When we're looking at expectations of trend exhaustion, we often see momentum beginning to shift when a trend starts to exhaust itself. So a lot of times in a newer trend, here's a strategy. This is on um, Adobe. This was a short that I had a couple days ago. And this came really strongly off of the highs. Nice, sharp, two-wave correction, much stronger than average. So if you go and look at this impulse move compared to past ones, it goes much, much more quickly than previous moves. Now, over here, coming out of, this is actually a strategy call, an avalanche. We've got our two-wave move up. Notice that each of those waves up has very similar size and similar momentum. So these two impulse moves tell you that there's exhaustion that's starting to come in here. So our strategy was shorting coming out of this trading range and the continuation that played uh, forward coming out of that as well. And you'll notice that as this breaks down, this breakdown at one, it has a measured impulse move going into two. So initial target level was going into, it's the 61.8% uh, Fibonacci extension and the reason we look for that level as a zone to start to protect profits is because of this measured impulse move where the momentum is just the same over here as over here. What you will notice though is that our trend channel B is much weaker 
than A. So on a larger time frame, B here is still trying to put an impulse move in on the larger time frame, but the momentum is much slower than we see in A. So it's going to struggle to try to get to that 100% exact measured move. And in fact, um, it was either today or late yesterday, it went back down into the 61.8, a little bit of a better test of that, and held that zone. So the fact that the momentum shifted here, that is what allowed this to turn around more easily and not go to what would be that 100% measured move. So the second thing that we look for when we're examining trends are to count the waves. So we looked at momentum. That is one of the key building blocks of price development. The second one is trend placement. And this relies upon wave count. How many of you guys use Elliott Wave? How many of you guys have heard of Elliott Wave? All right. So when I started trading, I didn't know what Elliott Wave was. It wasn't something that I ran into. I learned about it at like an expo after I was already speaking, in fact. And um, I had already recognized that the market tends to move in certain groups or waves. Now, back when I was first uh, teaching technical analysis, I did focus on variations of Elliott Wave, looking at the three wave count where you will get an initial move, a secondary move, and a third move. Longer correction, two a correction, and then you can get, again, a repeat. One, two, three. If it tries to go past that third one, you're more likely to get a shift in momentum that can create a reversal strategy. And this reversal strategy here is the one that I'm gonna teach you guys here later today. Now, in today, I have started to look at trends a little bit differently. And I'll show you guys that here in a second. But before we get to that, I want you to pay attention to something called time development. So when you're looking at trends and you're looking at time development, time development is basically that little pause that takes place between impulse moves. So if you have an impulse move on the downside, you'll get a correction before you can get another impulse move that can have that same amount of strength to it, right? So if you have a correction like here, and then you see that same amount of time here, then that tells you that you are at a period that could have a good continuation again, that it's corrected long enough to sustain another move. Uh, here we've got a little bit of a bigger one. I marked this Z. And these are fractal in nature too. So you're going to get the small little corrections and then the bigger little corrections. So if you're a trend trader and you're looking for continuations in the market, you wanna look for zones of congestion and then where you see a repetition of similar zones of congestion over time, that can give you a clue that you're now at a level that can sustain another impulse move. So this is just another thing we're not looking quite in terms of like trend exhaustion with this, but it helps you to understand trends. Now I mentioned earlier that I kind of have shifted how I look at trends these days. I am more prone to counting trends in terms of waves of two, two and two and two and two. I like to count twos and twos over and over again. So a lot of times when I see something like this here, this A and B, the first one, two, three, when you see the same type of thing in different formats, sometimes this first move down here is longer, it bounces up, and then you'll get more of a base. And so I treat this start here from the beginning of A to the end of B as a congestion zone, as a correction period. So I'm really looking at this first move one as my first impulse move, and then three as my second impulse move. It's a little bit of a different way to think of things, but what you're going to find is that if you start thinking more in waves of two, when this momentum is all different in here, when this pulls lower down here and this one pulls up in here, you can get more of that sideways range type of thing happening. So like in here, a lot of people will say, oh, hey, this goes to a lower low. So are we looking at one, two, three, four? Well, if instead you're thinking this is a trend move where each of these corrections is about the same, now we have a little bit of a longer correction, and even though it's going to a slightly lower low here, it pulls back up, overall, the momentum of this channel is sideways. 
So we're really looking at a two-wave correction here, one and two, before we get the continuation. So if you can start to think uh, a little bit more like that, it's going to help you out in the future, and I'm going to show you that here as we go forward. So here's that two-wave count. And uh, this is in regards to uh, one of our trades in oil this a uh, couple of weeks ago. Hmm, it wasn't even a couple of weeks ago, about a week and a half or so ago. And no, this was not oil. This was the dollar yen. Sorry. I trade futures, forex, and stocks. <laughs> so I'm kind of all over the place. Whatever's moving, giving me a setup. That's what I'm trading. So this was our dollar yen. And uh, just like that very first slide that I showed you, we had a really similar pattern that was forming intraday on the dollar again. And I often count again in those waves of two. So we were dealing with a situation where we'd had a number of test of highs here on the dollar yen on uh, the daily time frame and intraday time frame. And then we had this another two wave little pop, kind of back up into the upper end of what was a larger trend channel. So what I started to watch for at that point is counting the waves of the correction. And what you'll often find is that these waves are even broken down into smaller sets of two. So this first move down where you've got one low and then you've got a lower low. Well, within each of that, you've got one move, two moves, and then it goes into this two wave sideways trend. Well, this first move, one and two and then you go one and two again. So this one and two repeats over and over again. And when you're looking at impulse moves, you can look at these initial impulse moves and then look at the continuation. And as long as the continuation has similar momentum as that initial impulse move, you've got a really good chance that that second move is going to be approximately the same amount of price development. Over here, the breakdown coming out of here actually picks up momentum. So now you've got a slower trend that started, a slower upswing, and then it breaks to the downside with stronger momentum. So that means that this impulse move now on the downside can go much further than this first initial turn around off of the highs. And in fact, it kept going very, very well. Um, even further than you see here. So the third thing that we're watching is that momentum shift. That's our third building block. And here we're going to get into the patterns. So back in 2013 here when I gave a very similar class, I actually was speaking about a different strategy uh, that was taking place within each of these highs. But we also have a same similar strategy that you're seeing over and over and over again these days. And I've been running a trading room. I've ran a trading room since uh, around 1998 or so. And uh, I ran it full time for 12 years. So I was calling trades all day. I lived, breathed, dreamt about the markets. So it is really ingrained. I was talking um, here with Randall. I had to take a, a little bit of time off. I had um, a really a serious injury, cerebrospinal fluid leak, um, basically hole in my spinal column. And it took me out of the markets for a while. And the great thing about my job and what I do is that as soon as I was able to get back onto a computer, I was able to pick up where I left off. Not much has changed in the markets. Certain markets are more in favor now than they would have been before. Um, you know, I started off as a swing trader, then went into trading futures then went into trading Forex when Forex became a little bit less like the Wild West, like it was 20 years ago. And now, of course, you're seeing people getting into cryptos and Bitcoin and all of that stuff. And you can go and take the stuff that I'm teaching you here today and really apply it to any market, any time frame. It doesn't matter if you're an options trader, if you're a futures trader. It's still all going to be good, solid, technical stuff. And I don't rely on a lot of indicators. I'm not going to have to teach you things like stochastics, MACD, all of that stuff. I'm teaching you guys to read pure price action. You can go and apply your moving averages. You can go and apply your other stuff as like a little bit of additional visualization. Always come back to the price action though because that is what is really going to determine even when your indicators are failing take your indicators off and look at what that pure price action is doing. Very simple things like watching momentum, watching for these measured moves. So here, this strategy is one that I call a 2T. And it is basically a move that falls a little bit short 
of a previous high. And then it puts in a second move that goes and creates a slightly higher high. Within that move, you've got your two wave trends. And this can also be broken up into two waves. So you'll have two waves up, two waves down, two waves up. That's really common as well. So this strategy is one that I called in room right around five years ago. And I'm going to show you the details. How do all of these traits come together to create this pattern? Well, here's the template for the 2T. So those of you that are taking pictures here, go ahead and do that. I'll actually give you a link where you guys can get a copy of this PowerPoint so you can study it later at the end of uh, class here. Actually, it's TonyHanson.com backslash expo. Really easy if you want to. TonyHanson.com backslash expo. So you can go there, sign up, get a copy of the PowerPoint. So this 2T strategy, as one where we are looking at a strong impulse move up into a high. Ideally, this is going to be like an all-time high in the market, or it's going to be a, going into like previous levels of resistance. Um, there's a lot of different types of resistance you can use. But you want a move that is average to stronger than average going into that first high. You can get an average pullback correction, average move up into this slightly lower high a pullback, and then the move into the slightly higher high. So that this overall channel here is now shifting compared to that first rally, that first run. These little moves inside here, these smaller impulse moves, they can still be just as fast as that first initial rally. What's important is the fact that this whole channel here is now shifting. Now, this strategy is one where it hasn't early entry trigger when the channel going into that second high breaks lower. The thing you have to watch for here is that sometimes there's a little bit of a blurp that can happen right there. So it can pull down just slightly enough to break that lower channel, go into just a slightly higher high, and then break. So when you're putting your stop above that slightly higher high, if you can drop down to a smaller time frame and look for a little bit of a shift in momentum on that smaller time frame, you're going to have a much better entry you're gonna have less of a chance of having to hold through just a little bit of a flush before it starts working in your favor. First target level on this is the lower end of this channel, and this is something that happens like 90 some percent of the time. So if you've got enough distance between your entry here and your stop to justify that trade going into that target level, then that's a great spot to even take a little bit of the position off, even if you're looking to hold for a larger turnaround. Now, the larger um, confirmation of this pattern is when it comes into this lower channel, it'll usually pause there for a couple of bars, and then it will break. And that offers you a secondary entry. So sometimes this parallelogram here will be more narrow than others. When it's very narrow, then this is an excellent uh, setup or potential uh, compared to what your risk is. Target levels to watch for, like I said, there's that zone here where it kind of congests. That's your first support to watch for. And then your next is where this V breaks to the upside. That's your next zone of support. Which one of those levels is going to hit varies. It, it varies a lot depending upon what's happening with the trend development, the trend placement. I talk about this a lot uh, during our live training throughout the week. I actually have free sessions on Fridays. Uh, you guys are welcome to join me for those. Uh, let's see here. So going on forward, here is that dollar yen. And here are the measured moves. So we get the two wave move on the upside. I call this a leg because we get this little kneecap in the middle. This is actually another reversal strategy up here that uh, is called a momentum reversal. And then it pulls back, you'll usually get a little two wave pullback. And then again, that two wave measured move. So you can see here on this case that this kind of pulled back and would have broken that channel right here and then went to that slightly higher high. So that's that little blurp I told you about that can happen. So you wanna be a little bit um, more in tune to what's going on on the smaller time frames. If it has that measured move exactly, there's less of a chance that you're going to see this happening. But I usually try to wait for that little blurp to go into that position. That's a really technical term there, blurp. Make sure you wrote that down. It's going to be quiz. <laughs> 
So also we've got our wave count. Two waves up, you get two wave correction, two wave up. These often have little two waves and two waves again. So if you can count those two waves going into that high, you're gonna be pretty good. Next thing is the momentum shift. So like I said earlier, this whole thing needs to shift momentum compared to over here. And here's that smaller uh, momentum reversal I was telling you about. So this is what's happening on the even smaller time frame here. So when you go and tighten that up into the intraday charts, that's what was going on at that, that high there where you actually started to get the turnaround. So you can see there was a momentum shift intraday as well with the move up. So, lovely, it worked five years ago, right? All right, what about now? Well, now here we've got our dollar Swiss, and we had a strategy that was a really good variation of this here just a week or so ago. Uh, we talked about it in our League of Traders, where we have, again, the first initial move up, pull back, Second move, measured move, goes into a slightly higher high. This, this high here is a slightly lower high. Got a nice little two of correction in the middle. The thing that's different about this one is that you've got a pretty wide parallelogram here. So when the parallelogram is wider, then that lower end of that channel can serve as some better support. So we were looking at that as a place to take off part of the position. Always on something like this, you can go and drill down to, sm to smaller time frames and follow this last channel up to highs. And when it gets into that measured high zone, that's when you can look for those channel breaks. So we've got another example here, of course, on the dollar yen just recently. The momentum is shifting. You're not quite seeing that 2T here really pretty on this time frame. But when we go down to that last little section of it, this was coming off of a high over here, it's kind of off screen, and this is that second two wave move up. So of that pattern, that second wave up is this section. What you'll notice is that there was a little bit of a pop here at the very end. So overall, the momentum had shifted, even though we had a little bit of a pop up here. So that meant that instead of taking that you know pure channel break from that second move, we waited to look for intraday action to offer the continuation instead. And uh, one of the big positions was put on over here when it was just a, a continuation of that move. But it was the same pattern. And then we also had this again last week on eBay, just flipped over on the, uh, the upside. It was forming a pattern coming off of the lows. So one of the things that I trade a lot are opening gaps. I love to trade the momentum on some of these opening gaps. You've got things like uh, Whirlpool and um, Let's see, Harley Davidson today. Uh, those are just a couple of examples today where we had some pretty large gaps. eBay, what was interesting about eBay was that it had a pretty solid downside gap to it. And we were looking at coming into some initial support. So even though I liked the potential that it could head lower a little bit later on, I was still expecting that this is something that could turn around, give us a little bit of a midway correction during the day before it tried to bring in additional selling. So what happens a lot of times on these gap plays is you'll get initial momentum in the morning where you'll have a gap is not too extreme. 10 o'clock or so Eastern, you'll start to get reversal strategies where you'll get usually two waves of the counter trend move midday. Sometimes it goes to three, but usually that third one can be a little bit weaker and it's not as much of a guarantee of a move, but you'll usually start to get those reversal strategies. So we were looking at eBay here in today, and first thing we notice, hey, this comes into a low, it had gap down, form that V, comes back down, not quite to that previous low, goes into that range, and then offers that measured impulse move where the momentum's the same, Overall, it shifts the entire momentum of the channel, though, as compared to over here, where again, you get your leg down with your little kneecap. So this overall channel is starting to shift. So at that point, we start to look for reversal strategies off of that low. What you'll notice is that it gets off to a little bit of a slow start here. Pretty typical when you've got a gap. Um, we were watching this from the very beginning, going into this support zone here. Um, I'm going to get back to you and show you guys the screenshots from our live room, but 
Another thing, of course, we're doing is the wave count. You've got your two wave count, two waves over here. This is often two waves, so you can see there's actually three in this one. And this is where you will see me count more as this is your first wave, then you kind of get a two wave correction, and then this is your third, your, your second wave. So even though you're seeing three, in my mind, I'm thinking more two, because that is what tends to work out as the pattern more over time. And once I made that transition to thinking like that, things didn't matter as much what was going on in here. Often if you had like a move here, if this was maybe a smaller upside move, then I could do a measured move where this move would be measured compared to here, where I would then have a comparable move. So that's why I kind of made that a little bit of a switch. Um, then we've got a momentum shift here. I show you that momentum shift a little bit more clearly. And I told you there's two ways you can enter a 2T or 2B. This is a 2B, two bottoms. The first way is to use this channel from the second draw and take that channel break. The increased risk, of course, with this is that it can go and do a slightly lower low at times. So it can be worthwhile to wait for a secondary entry that you might see a little bit of a momentum shift happening a little bit better on. The second way you can do it is you can take this high to this high, draw that out, and use that channel break. So that's what we've got happening over here. And this is the one we were following in the room because it starts to hug that upper channel a little bit better. So it kind of gives us a little bit of a better entry. Uh, let's see here. So here's our charts looking at, this is a screenshot of the room. So you can see this is where we were going right into that second, that next low there. Here's our first two lows. Then momentum was starting to shift here. And I was showing them how this can then play out at that point. And then our next screenshot here is where we were talking about, okay, so what's gonna happen next? Well, usually with your two Bs and your two Ts, you're gonna get two waves. And then after that, things can get a little bit sloppier. So first two waves up, we were looking at an initial move, two wave correction, and then the continuation. So you can see that's exactly how this ended up playing out. We've got our initial move up, two wave correction. It's a little bit messy, but then it goes and does the continuation so that this move here, is as long as the momentum is the same, you are looking at that measured move zone as your target level. Now, this over here, you'll notice it has the same amount of correction for time, but momentum's a bit stronger here. So this is not as solid of a trade. You got a more risky bet in something like this. So like a trade over here, when you're coming off of these lows, you know you're gonna hit those target levels pretty easily with decent momentum most of the time. After those first two waves, when you're dealing with a gap on the downside, and this is now going in to close the gap, the first two waves are the ones that you can kind of count on, you can bank on. After that, it's not as much of a guarantee. So this did end up continuing midday. In fact, I had another trade on Intel around the same time, very, did the exact same thing. It had another move up into midway, and then it shifted momentum. So that's where I'll start to watch for things like the 2T again intraday. Uh, you'll often see that pattern flip back over and then it will turn the trend back around later in the day. Doesn't really happen on this example, but in general, that's the pattern that I would start to watch for after that. Let's see, how am I doing on time here, guys? Good, all right. Okay, so. Um, like I said, I trade a number of markets and we follow a number of markets and uh, one of the questions that came up a couple weeks ago is bonds. What's happening in bonds right now? So looking at this chart, can you guys see that 2T pattern in here? Anybody? You're supposed to be saying yes, of course. Okay, so what we're looking at here is cut off all of this section over here and just start looking from around mid-May. So we've got the move up. We've got, I'll go back to that chart here in a second. We've got the move up. We've got a pullback, another move up, slightly lower high, pullback, slightly higher high. So 
in here, here's our little impulse moves that we're looking at. So it, you can see, you know, as you get to each of those impulse moves, kind of expectation that things are going to slow down. And here is a little bit of a clearer version of what is happening with the, the uh, 2T itself. So those first initial two moves off of the lows, you've got that move there mid-June, a pullback. So you see this first low here and then the second low. So that's what I'm looking for is I'm looking for these two lows. And then I'll take this high, well I'll take these two lows, I'll connect these two lows, extend that trend channel right there. That's like your little blue dash here. And then I'll take this high. And even though I won't have that higher high a lot of the times yet, I extend that line too. So that becomes my upper level of resistance on this. And as it comes into that level, that's where I start to then look for reversal strategies. So this wasn't quite to a higher high yet, so then I'm like, okay, it's gonna do that little blurp. You guys wrote down the blurp, right? So it can do that little blurp, go to that little slightly higher high, and then start to turn around at that point. So I zone down in on what's happening on the smaller time frames at that point. Looking for the momentum shift. Here's the start of that momentum shift. Here's that pure channel break entry, would have been right around here. But this also had another strategy, um, I call it an avalanche, that also offered up a secondary strategy. If you missed the first entry, which I did, I missed the first entry. So I looked for the second one, which is your two-wave correction. In fact, this pattern right here looks exactly like Whirlpool on the daily time frame right now. If you go and pull that up with our little gap down on Whirlpool. So here's the short on this and you can see how this plays out where this momentum is still really strong here as it's putting in the second wave higher. So right here it starts to kind of shift a little bit and you start to see that move from being more of a flat side to kind of slowing down. Once that channel breaks that gives that initial trigger there and then here's just the secondary opportunity for it. So, I told you guys, this is exactly the same type of thing you will see playing out day in and day out. Well, here is this morning on the NQ. Can you guys see that 2T on the NQ? NQ is our NASDAQ futures. So, we've got this strong move up to the upside, two-wave correction here. Here's your first low. You can see there's a second low in here, here to here. You've got your move up, it's shy of the previous high. And then it goes and it puts in that second wave up. It goes to the slightly higher high. So your two waves are one pullback, little two of correction pullback, two, slightly higher high. Entry trigger is right here. And then here's the continuation trigger that was just like the one here. So you get that little two-wave little bounce, and that can get you into a position if you miss that initial 2T. So what I want you guys to do is to really kind of get the feel for these over and over again. Like I said, they repeat, no matter what market, what time frame, and there's many versions of this as well. Once you start to understand the basic um, feel for these patterns, you're going to see a number of different variations of them start to play out. Uh, I give a lot of classes uh, to my traders where we look specifically at variations of these. Like I said, you can join me on Fridays absolutely free to get some of this additional education as well. But to get a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, just go to TonyHanson.com backslash expo. And uh, that will allow you to sign up for the PowerPoint, get a copy of the PowerPoint. And you'll also get an invitation to those Friday classes so that you can join in on those absolutely free as well. So does anyone have any questions today? Yes. Um, this is a 500 tick chart here on this one. So what we're looking at is just the momentum to this, the, from this move here, is slower than the momentum here. Um, I use different uh, time frame charts. So like when I'm trading futures, I will use pure time frame charts like the 120 minute 
the 30 minute, five minute, but I also use tick charts. And because I'm watching the momentum and the trends development on both of those, and if I see something happening on one, it gives me a clue as to what the risk is gonna be on the other. So if there's a pattern on one, I'll trade it on, on that time frame. It doesn't necessarily mean that one is better than the other. They're both really good at giving you clues as far as momentum and trend development. Yes? So, yeah, I don't know, for experience, Right, so um, depends on what you're trading. Like if you're trading Forex, <laughs> for example, you kind of got to be there around 3 in the morning, Eastern. <laughs> so if you're really an early bird, Forex market is great for you. <laughs> if you have just moved to Tucson and you're trying to trade Forex, it's not so great. A lot of those moves take place around 3, 4 in the morning or 8 o'clock in the morning. Those are when you get some of these strongest setups forming. Um, if you're trading e-mini futures, really any time of the day I see those patterns. Um, there are certain correction periods during the day that you will see um, bigger moves starting more often. So for example, like I talked about gap trades, once it gets to about 10 o'clock, if you've had a trend move in something that's gapped, around 10 o'clock is when you'll start to see these corrections happening where you can get the counter trend moves and then it can continue later on in the day. Um, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that's another time that you'll get a number of the strategies forming. So those are, are different times depending upon, you know, the market that you're trading. And you use for What's that? For options? It's, the, it's about the same. About yeah, it's the same. Okay. Yes? Right, so when you're looking at like uh, this for example, when you're looking at target levels, this is a pretty narrow channel. So the first target level is where you get that little pause here midway. So this is where you'll first expect where you can get a pause. Um, and then at that point, you can also look for a measured move like here and then the continuation and that can give you an idea that that's where the next pause is going to be. It, it also tends to correspond with the break of this channel here. So that's this target right here, that second support target, that's that next one. And then depending upon where this is taking place in the larger trend, that's when you can get even more with another continuation, but this is the main part of the pattern. So you'll be, I'll be looking for this almost every single time. Um, but if I'm looking for more, then it's because there's something else that's happening on a larger time frame too. And then this is just a smaller pattern within a much bigger, uh, much bigger pattern. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Not really. Um, so you'll notice I don't have a lot of indicators on my charts. You can add volume and what will happen is that as this is moving into that second high, volume will be declining. So as compared to the rally into this first high over here, this move into the second high, you'll see less volume this time around. And then the opposite is true at the bottom. Right, so then right in here, this little continuation strategy, volume will start to drop. So it'll be the highest right here, and then it will drop until here when it breaks, and then it will pick up again. So basically you'll have a divergence in volume where it'll slow down, and in fact, right before this breaks down is often like the lightest volume that you will have seen this entire segment. And so that's a really good indicator um, if you want to add volume. The same thing would have happened over here. You would have expected the volume would have dropped off throughout here. You would have seen the lightest volume of this entire congestion right here, right before it starts to pick up. Good question. Anybody else? Okay, well, since you weren't all picking out the two T's earlier when I was showing them to you, if I go back to this slide now, do you guys see it now? Yeah? So this is good practice to take that template and just really look to what's happening in the market. If you see a high and a slightly higher high, grab this template and say, do I see those two waves there going into that high? Start to get into the feel 
I usually will recommend like hiding uh, what happened afterwards and going bar by bar to watch as it unfolds so that you can watch these measured moves here unfold. You can watch the shift in momentum happening up here at the highs and then that will start to train your brain to start to recognize it and see it as it's actually unfolding. So once you start to see it over and over again, it's just gonna click. And it might take a couple days, it might take a couple weeks. If you keep looking for it, you're gonna to get to a point where it just clicks and you're gonna start seeing this everywhere. All right, anybody else have any other questions? Yes? What was your entry point on the short there? Uh, no, so usually I drop down to smaller time frames, and in this example, I use, um, I use that two-way account. And so when this had this first initial move up, then the correction, second move up where that momentum is slower, that's what triggers my short there. And I just used uh, this high here. So again, this was a secondary setup. The initial setup, if you just took the channel break, would have been right around here, and your stop would have been above that high. Yes? Um, I usually put hard stops on with um, a bracket order where I have, uh, it will get me out of part of the position at initial support, and then I will have a stop above the high. But when I'm going into something like this, if I'm using like a, an early entry, maybe the channel breaks early, I'm going to keep it very wide because I know that there can be a little bit of back and forth right away. If it gives me a secondary setup, I don't have to worry about that as much. I don't have to worry about the flush type of action that could happen right at that exact high. Um, another thing I do with exiting positions is I will get out a part of the position really pretty quickly, which shocks a lot of people. But the reason I do that is because then as the trade unfolds, I'm managing it based upon how the momentum plays out. So if momentum starts to shift, it's not giving me like the immediate follow through on the downside that I'm expecting, then I can go and shift the setup so that I can widen my stop if I need to, I can add back into the position later. So I do a little bit of management there, which means that when I get taken out of a position, a lot of the times I don't end up with a full stop because of how I've managed it with kind of the, how I scale in. Um, that's something I can show you guys more on Fridays or in League of Traders if you guys are part of that. I know some of you are. Uh, then uh, that gets into more of the, the trade management. But what it means is that when I take a stop, I'm not usually taking a full stop because of how I've managed the position. I know that trades are supposed to go at certain periods if it doesn't get that momentum picking up within that certain amount of time, then something is wrong. So here on uh, our bonds here, it's really normal for things to start to go slow and then they have to pick up momentum. And in fact, uh, over the last couple of days, we saw exactly that. So at this point over here, this really just kind of went into free fall mode here, just the last two days. So a lot of times this part up here basically on your 2T, it can start out a little bit slower and then it will start to free fall after that point. All right, any other questions? Yes? What is the average holding period for your trade? Oh, <laughs> that varies. Um, so I do everything from day trading to swing trading to position trading. Intraday, usually I'm gonna be holding for an hour to a couple of hours. I'm not like a super scalper. <laughs> I'm not like in and out and in and out. Yeah, I usually don't have more than about three to six trades a day probably is my average. Um, but what I consider to be a trade would be like this pattern here, taking this as a short, taking off partials, adding back in, taking some off, adding back in. So I consider this entire move where I'm playing that entire momentum to be one trade because I'm never fully out of the trade. So what, what, what is your swing trade? How long is your swing trade? Because everybody's swing trade. Swing trades are usually three to five days. And then you pick also the same type of a pattern here? Or yep. 
Yeah, yeah, so you'll find this exact setup on a daily chart too. You'll find it on a weekly chart. Any time frame, it doesn't matter. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, it's just flip it upside down. Flip the pattern upside down. Yeah, so if you're looking for a bullish one like on eBay, let's see, scroll back up there. Yeah, so eBay here, whoops, too far. So it's the same thing. You're just looking for that move here into the lower low and then turning it around. And then here's that continuation move. You can get it on the smaller scale. So this is what can serve as like your initial entry when you're looking at that shift in momentum too. Yes? Can you just your percentages of long or short trades of 50-50? I'm pretty even. Um, I don't have a bias one way or the other. Um, if there is even like a slight difference, I might be a little bit more on the short side than the long side, but overall, doesn't really matter. Um, a big thing is uh, when I got into trading, I was coming into the tech bubble. So I was used to swings in the market. And once you trade that and you get used to trading that from the very beginning, you don't get complacent in a market like this where it's been a bull market for a while because you, you know all of the things that come into play when you can get reversals that can happen. So it's, my strategy is basically one where I'm playing a lot of the flow of the market and I'm not really like a bull or a bear. I'm just whatever presents itself, I'm gonna trade it. All right, yes. I use Fibonacci. Use uh, Fibonacci fans and Fibonacci extensions. So like for example, on um, these, uh, when you're using a Fibonacci fan, a lot of times this is gonna be hugging one of those fan lines. Uh, you go from your high to your low to draw your fan. Uh, when you're looking at continuation strategies like this bull flag in here, well Phoenix, you would go from your low to the high, and then the 76.4% Fibonacci fan, that's gonna be great time development for when that would give you an entry trigger for a continuation move. So yeah, I do teach Fibonacci to a degree because it is one of those uh, very few indicators that doesn't end up cluttering up things and I can teach people exactly when to use it and when to ignore it. So it's a very basic one. Fibonacci fans, or you can use, um, you can also use Fibonacci extensions for, that can really help you out with trying to measure these equal measured moves. So when momentum is stronger, like let's say you get your, your reversal here off of the lows, and you're looking at this first rally, you get the correction, and then you're trying to decide, okay, well where's it gonna go for the second target level? And let's say momentum actually picks up and it increases. If you draw a Fibonacci extension where you're going from this low to this high, and then your third point is here, then it's gonna plot like the 123.6, the 138.2. So if your momentum is stronger on the continuation than it was going into it, if your impulse move is stronger, then you can use the 123.6, 138.2 as your target levels, and you're gonna find that they hold incredibly well. Anyone else? Yes. Right, so her question is, do I connect what's happening, um, the, pre the pattern that I'm following to what's going on in the overall market? And that depends, like with something like eBay. eBay was moving based upon earnings. So it was kind of in its own little bubble. And when you're dealing with earnings plays, the overall market can impact it if you're at a major level of support or resistance, but it has less of an impact than it would if you were just trading like 
Netflix with no news and you see that pattern, then if you see something happening in the overall market that goes against what your pattern is on Netflix, it can have a bit more of an impact on it. Any other questions? I think we're about out of time here. <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to come in and cut me off. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I'll throw that link up there again.